Thank you so much for having me here. Um, so, I think my presentation, awesome, okay. So, um, as Joe mentioned, I am a content strategist and I am uh, very much interested in content and what it means to work with content, how we relate to content in the projects we work on. And I'm sure that everybody here interested in UX cares about content. But I'm gonna talk today about an issue that has come up a lot for me in my work with content, and that's control. I think that a lot of us feel like we want to control our projects all the time, right? We wanna control every aspect of what we do because we're probably sometimes a little bit perfectionist. We want things to be the best they can possibly be. And it gets a little bit tricky. I wanna talk about that trickiness because I think that content ends up being this thing that we all bang our head against. We all kind of reach this point where projects are going great, everything's moving along, and then the content isn't right or isn't there. And there's these problems that come up over and over and over again, these problems that sometimes feel intractable in our UX projects. Just think about this, if you've heard these before. One of my favorites is when somebody says at the beginning of a project, don't worry about the content, we already have the content. We have plenty of content. And you're looking around and you're like, yeah, like Hoarders has plenty of stuff too, but this isn't good, this isn't gonna work. This is, this is the content you think is gonna, is gonna work? You've just crap, like, piled up crap since 1994 and stuck it in a drawer somewhere and you think that the content's all ready for this project? Okay, good, good, okay, good start. And you get this problem, which is a, a really fun problem um, in a lot of organizations, especially I see this a lot in big organizations where teams from like a, a UX team are tasked with doing things like wireframing pretty early in a project. They're like, just get, get the thing on the paper. We need to see the thing on the paper. And then later you're trying to come back to the content and you're like, well, just drop it in the wireframes, it'll be fine. And you're sitting there going like, you wanna put that here? Like, okay, well, let's get some bungee cords and some duct tape, like no problem. Just, just kind of make it happen, right? Or one of my favorite problems recently is what I see people doing on mobile. Um, because, you know, mobile's hard, mobile's complicated. And a lot of people are really trying to just streamline it. Don't worry, we have a mobile site, and our mobile site has everything our mobile user could want. And it's kind of like when you go to the grocery store and they're like, we have bread. And you're like, but I needed milk. How about some bread? And you just get this situation over and over again where you're like, no, but bread's great, but I didn't come here for bread. I came here for something else, and that's all you have to offer me. Because somebody else decided what I was looking for, right? Somebody else decided that that's all I needed. I see this problem all the time because I work a lot directly with content and the people who are producing it. And you have these conversations where they're like, no, our people got it. We've got some really great people who are producing content. And you're looking around and you're like, has anybody ever proofread this? Much less thought about the overall quality and what messages it was supposed to have. Does this have a point? Does it have a purpose? Or everybody's favorite, the carousel. The carousel says, look how important I am. I'm important too. And it says, we couldn't make a decision. It says, we all got together and we all agreed that everybody was equally important all the time. So everybody gets to go on the homepage with equal priority all the time. So, okay. I've seen every one of these problems a lot of different times and I bet you guys have too. And sometimes this is how we end up feeling. We end up like, this, this, this is why. This is why nothing's ever good. We end up frustrated that our projects don't reach their full potential because the content that you end up dealing with is not what you intended or anticipated or wanted. We end up feeling like everybody else is just making this a problem and we can't get where we want to go. So the good news is that this is what I deal with, right? I'm a content strategist. Like I should be the solution to your problem here, right? Like I'm a content strategist so obviously what I'm supposed to get up here and say is that content strategy is gonna fix this problem for us. That would be a delightful answer. To get up here and say, just do a content audit. Misty talked about content audits yesterday, if any of you were in her session. It's about understanding what content you have, what you don't have, what gaps you have, what's working for you, what isn't. Content audits are incredibly useful for identifying information. They're a great tool. So are things like style guides. 
I've produced style guides. Style guides are supposed to help with consistency and clarity of information to ensure that lots of different people publishing content have the same set of standards, same rule book to go by. Or even something that I personally love, the content model. Um, I'm gonna be talking a lot about content modeling this afternoon. And uh, content modeling is this method of breaking down the content that you have into different types, looking at the, the patterns that are within that content and figuring out how they fit together and how they come together to make meaning. So each of these things individually is a really valuable tool. And I feel like it's like, yeah, you know, we're sorting out the content, we're getting a plan, we're gonna get the consistency in there. This is gonna fix it all. This should fix these problems. And I, I thought that it would for a long time. And in fact, I would say the first several years that I had kind of like moved from doing this, whatever I was doing before, mix of writing and editing and stuff like that, into doing something that was more officially called content strategy, it was getting better. All those tools were helping my projects. They're all valuable. But then, something happened. I had a conversation that went something like this. I'd been working on a project with a client, and I had it all mapped out. I really knew what needed to happen to their content. We're just gonna move this over here and redo this, and this is really the problem area, and here's what we gotta do. I had some good ideas. But my client wasn't happy. My client wasn't happy with me, because what was happening in our meetings, what was happening with his team internally, was that I had jumped all the way ahead to the solution, and they were sitting there still trying to figure out what they were doing right now. And these are people who were very dedicated to their work. There are a few people who felt out that what they had been working on was very important. And they certainly didn't want to be told that they'd been doing it wrong. They didn't deserve to be told they were doing it wrong either. But hearing that, getting this idea that like, I've jumped to the answers and they still don't know what the questions are made me feel like I was being punched in the face. It hurt, it hurt to have somebody tell me that. But I realized that he was right. And he was right for some very specific reasons. He was right because the way that I was looking at content was very much about content being an input. I was making some things better by thinking of content this way because I was focusing on these documents, these things that are gonna help us get the content into the project. But what I was missing was that that was only half the story. Because I was only thinking of it as the thing that goes into the website, the thing that we're gonna put into our sketches, put into our wireframes, put into our prototypes, the thing that we're going to get in. What I wasn't thinking about was the other end, which is the fact that the content that we're trying to deal with is almost always the product of an organization. It's coming out of an organization. It doesn't matter what I want to put into my piece of this project. You have to start thinking about where's it coming from, the culture that's producing it. It's a product of their different departments. It's a product of their priorities. It's a product of their expectations. And so when you start thinking about content in that way, so just take a step back from looking at it in terms of your specific need for it, you start realizing that it reveals a lot about the values and beliefs of an organization. It reveals a lot about their attitude, but what the purpose of that website even is. It reveals ideas about what the business's future is. It reveals ideas about um, underlying baggage. I really do think that when you start talking about content, it's really hard to not start talking about organizational baggage. And I know yesterday in Don Norman's talk, he talked a bit about organizational change and how difficult that actually is. And it's true. But when we start talking about content in really honest ways, and we start talking about things like why we can't prioritize what goes on a homepage, we start getting at some of those deep conversations. We start getting at some of those discussions that we haven't spent enough time having. And we start being able to ask why a lot better. Why did we launch a blog and have that blog failed? Why did the CEO say that we had to do it? What was what was she trying to get out of it? You start hearing about all these internal pressures. You start hearing about these weird backstories. It gets a little bit political. You also start hearing about a lot of ownership issues, and I find this all the time. You hear about the way that people think that what they do is theirs. So, like, for example, I, I spent a long time working with an organization, it's a big state agency, 
where I worked with a woman who'd had the same job since 1986. It was like the same job since 86. And it was about managing this big statewide events calendar. And she thought of that calendar as hearse. It wasn't for the people who were using it. It was hearse. Because that was all she had. Her organization had changed over and over and over again. And now they had this tremendous web presence and she was overwhelmed by all of this change. So she clung to the thing that she could control. That's what she wanted. She wanted to control that content. She wasn't thinking about it as content that belongs to their audience. And those territorial issues, you better believe that they affect our users' experiences. You better believe that because she couldn't let go of that kind of control, that the end product suffered. It really comes down to fear of change, I think. The reasons that these things bubble up, the reason we get all these political conversations, the reason things get ugly. Because people want to cling to what they can own, right? They want to control what they can control. And you know, I see people who see everything changing around them, and I can just see the fear in their eyes. What if they make the wrong move? What if they become irrelevant? What if things have changed more than they can adapt to? What if it's just too hard for them? Those are the kinds of things I see when I look at a big group of people in an organization who are being tasked with changing the way that they produce their content and manage their content. A tremendous amount of fear. And I think this is coming out of a big change in the way our work actually happens. There was a time when what we did was make websites. We found an organization that needed a website, and then we built them a website. Or we worked at a company, and that company needed a website, so we built a website. The problem is that we don't really have these one-time things anymore. Websites aren't really a project, it's like a start and an end. Really what we're talking about is the web's really everything, right? Um, actually, Karen McGrain gives a great talk where she talks about how Razorfish had this, um, this motto back in like the late 90s that said, everything that can be digital will be. And you can look around and you can see the ways in which that is coming true, right? All of these things, and that includes all of these messy internal processes of organizations, all of these different initiatives, all these different ways that people communicate, they're all becoming digital. And I wonder if we're thinking about our work differently enough because of it, or if we're still thinking about our work too much as if it's just you can make a website as its own separate thing. So when the web is everything, I think it also brings up another part, which is the web is everyone. And what I mean by that is that in our projects, in the way that we work, oftentimes we're on what's called like a web team, right? So you're here, you're on a web team. But the web team isn't the only people who are working on the web. Even the people who don't get it, people who don't know, don't care about navigation, or taxonomy, or user goals, or interaction design, those people are still working on your website. They affect the things we build. And more than anything, I think they end up affecting the content. And they end up affecting the content both now, whenever you're working on whatever it is you're working on, but also in the long term, right? Because they're gonna change things, they're gonna add things. So I think in that way, when we're starting to talk about content, content itself is kind of the easy part. Like some of those tools and techniques, style guides and audits, putting together models and systems, they're hard, but they're not really the hard part because those things are controllable. What's a lot less controllable are the people. And so when we're trying to deal with that, these deliverables, these documents we make, they're not really gonna solve the problem because they're designed toward the task of a site launch, an overhaul, an app, a thing, right? They're a thing you do on the way to getting something done. They're not designed to deal with this ongoing mess of people and content and challenges. So I think that a tremendous amount of our work in user experience now is actually figuring out how we bring people along with us people who aren't traditionally part of user experience teams. And so that means we can't really look at our job as fixing things. That's kind of a short-term game. We have to see our work as being much more about facilitating some of these conversations to happen, facilitating change, helping organizations adapt so that what you're trying to do can actually have legs. But I wanna talk a little bit about the kinds of process we typically use now. I'm gonna show a couple of examples. 
of, um, of diagrams people have made to talk about user experience process. This one is from the UXPA. Um, and this one is all about stages. Um, it starts with research, kind of walks through all these different stages, and then if you get to the very top, if you can see in green, the big thing says done, right? It's this map to get you from beginning to end. Or we see stuff like this. This is the UX treasure map. This is about getting um, all these different things that go from really loose to really specific. It starts with things like stories, and then it gets you all the way to the very specific things like style guides and design patterns and specs. Even when we start talking about Agile, right, it's all about, it's cyclical, but it's all about getting through to the next release. When we talk about Lean UX, too, we talk about these processes that are all designed around a narrow focus. It's around saying, here's one thing we're trying to do, and we're gonna do this one thing before we move on to the next. So it might be iterative, but it's still very narrow. And I don't think there's anything wrong with any of these things, because those things are all designed to do one thing. Get shit done. Right, like, yeah, we gotta get shit done. That's <laughs> so you wanna control the steps, you wanna control the process, because ultimately, you have to get things out the door, right? Like, nobody's, nobody wants to not accomplish things. We have enough of that already. But there's a big question that I think gets left on the table oftentimes in these processes. And that's what's happening on the other side of the wall. Because so often, we get set in these processes that are how we do our work. This is how our user experience stuff gets done. And it sets us apart from people who are in the rest of the organization. And that doesn't work for content. Because content is both an input and an output. It's both a thing we need in our process and an output of all these other people. You can't just build a wall and expect it to work. When we get into our corners and we just do our thing, we can't deal with content. It furthers this divide, too, this divide that I think is really unhealthy. This divide that says we are the web team and you are not. Because that, that divide is increasingly made up, it's increasingly false. People have all kinds of roles that touch on and affect the web. So the more that we continue to set aside process and set aside that wall, the more that we end up in this place where like we get called things like ninjas or wizards or whatever, which is just crap, right? These are just BS words that say, I don't understand what you do and I don't need to. That's what that says. It says, I don't get it so you must be magical. Which would be great, it would be awesome if we were all magical. But we're not. We're smart people, we have important skills. We're not unicorns. And when people think that that's what we do, when people say, la la la, I don't understand your work, you must be magic, what we're saying is, it's okay, you just stay over there on that non-web side. We'll take care of all the web stuff. And the problems are gonna continue to happen. In fact, they're just gonna get worse because their work is gonna get more and more intertwined with the web and we're not gonna do anything about it. Whether you're dealing with something in marketing or sales, whether you're dealing with customer service, support, HR, whether you're dealing with an internal, like an app, uh, internal app or an intranet, whether you're dealing with sites that are a service in and of themselves with logins and user flows to contend with, whatever it is, our work is too intertwined with the whole world to try to set ourselves off as if nobody else can understand it. But at the same time, we're not just gonna hang out in a big conference room, eating deli sandwiches and talking about the homepage all day. I assume that all of you have spent enough time locked in a conference room with deli sandwiches that that's not really what you wanna spend all your time doing, is talking about it and talking about it and talking about it. Again, right? I'm gonna get shit done. So we need to have processes that we can control. We need to have ways that we keep things moving along. And it's normal that we've built some of these walls, these processes that we can own. The key is that we also need some parallel processes. We need some other ways of working that are not defined just to that project scope. We need some other tools to use to tackle what's happening on this other side. So I have some ways that I've started to do that when it comes to content, and I wanna share a few of them with you. I think the first thing is that we're thinking about content as a team sport. We have to say this is not something that's one person's responsibility. I might be the content strategist on your project, but I tell you what, I cannot control all that content. Particularly if you're dealing with anything larger than like a little teeny tiny website. If you're dealing with a whole organization, even just a complex group, you have to think about content as something that multiple people are going to be involved in from the very beginning. 
And how do you wrangle multiple people? How do you get a bunch of people to provide input? I found that it's really useful for me in my work to look at it as a series of, of workshops, of, of activity-focused days where we bring people together. Not just the very beginning, although that's very important, but to bring them together all the way through to work through content in a parallel process while people are also working through all of this stuff that goes into your particular UX process. I try to pull people together and get their input into a few different things. These are some of the common ones I use. First one's messaging. So when I start talking about messaging with people, what I'm really trying to get at is, who are we? What's important? What's true to us? And there's lots of ways you can workshop with this um, to get people involved. This image is an example of um, something I lovingly call the Margot method. Uh, Margot Bloomstein has this thing she talks about a lot. Um, and if you ever pick up her book, it's called um, Content Strategy at Work. She talks about a lot of different activities like this. Um, I love this one where it's all about card sorting, but it's card sorting personality traits, card sorting who your brand actually is. I've also done this in different ways. I've done this with things like Mad Libs. I've done this with surveys when I couldn't get people together. I've done it with like timed activities where people had to draft and agree to a statement. But here's what's key about this. This isn't just about saying, okay, sort these cards and tell me who you are. The way this works is you sit down and you go, okay, we have all of these different cards. We're gonna sort them into categories based off of who we are right now, who we wanna be, and who we're not. Okay, that's valuable in and of itself. But here's what's really cool about it. You put these little tactile objects in front of people and you make them actually talk about them and you listen to the conversations that happen. And what you start hearing is all the different ways that people in different groups have different perceptions about what's important. You start hearing the disagreements. You start hearing the things that are like, well, I mean, we'd like to be imaginative, but are we really imaginative? I mean, you know how everything always gets squashed and this happens, whatever. You hear that stuff. And those are things that you will not hear otherwise. And you will learn a tremendous amount if you stop and listen to those conversations about where that organization is right now and how far they can be pushed. Also, you'll come out of that with people who are really rallying around a few key terms and you can use that as a starting point. You can use that as a starting point for getting them to focus on their content and say, hmm, you've said you need all 47 of these things on the homepage. Let's go back and look at our, our messaging. How many of them actually match that? I've also spent a lot of time doing editorial style as something as a, of a team activity. And um, because it, it's not that hard for me as a content person, does this all the time, after I have an idea of their messaging and what they really want to be communicating, it's not hard for me to go back to my office and go, no problem, I'm gonna make you a style guide. And I sit down and I go, do, 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 you should do this, do that, like use the serial comma, capitalize these things in headlines, use these kinds of words, don't use these kinds of words. I could do that all day. But what I found is a lot more powerful if I can get them together and I can get them to start making those decisions. I can get them to start doing it. And the reason I like to get the people who are actually going to produce content and maintain content involved in that process is that then it's not me giving them rules. It's not rules coming down from above and saying, you gotta do this. Because what happens is people go, well, that's just arbitrary. That's just, arbit that's just arbitrary rules. I don't do it that way. Instead, what you're saying is, okay, we've agreed on what's important. Now let's come together and say, do we actually sound like that? I have this activity that I really like where I give people um, red post-it notes and green post-it notes. So red is, red is stop and green is go, right? So we use those to look at some actual pages of content. And I like to do this where I actually like will print things out and tape them to the wall and make people walk around the room and look at them. Look at them with all of their messaging, all of their goals, all the things they said they were important in mind. And I say, okay, Look at what you've done so far. Put up a green post-it note every time you see something that works. Every time you see something you wanna keep, you're like, yep, that is, that is exactly what I'm talking about about our messaging, that is that. Put up a green post-it note. But when you see something that isn't right, when you see something that doesn't match what you all just agreed to, put up a red one. And so I've done this activity where you get a big group of people together to do that, and this is really useful before you send people off to like produce content if you're trying to assign out like, okay, we're building this new thing, and we're gonna do a lot of content development, so we have 25 people who are doing things for their different departments. Right before you make those assignments and get those people working on their content, you do this activity. 
because they start seeing their content in a different light. And they start identifying things about it that feel too formal, too casual, things that feel outdated, things that feel, hmm, you know, not, doesn't really have our personality. And they get more specific about why it's not working. And then I do this thing where I collect all the notes for each of the pages. And like, I'm serious, I, a stack of notes. People get really into this. So for one page of content, you might have 10 different green notes and 10 different red notes from just a few people walking around the room. And then we kind of workshop through it. We get people into pairs and actually have them start rewriting. Okay, here's all your feedback. You got your reds, you got your greens, and you have this page of content. So work as a pair and draft a rewrite. And then we'll talk about it. We'll give feedback to one another. And it gets people into the right mentality to produce content that's gonna ultimately actually serve the purpose it's supposed to serve. And that's gonna ultimately actually fit into the experience that you've carefully planned. This is what I use to actually make a style guide. Instead of me going off into my room and saying like, here's what I think you should do, it comes out organically in all of these discussions. I make a list of things that I hear. I make a list of the trends and the things that have resonated with people. And I use that as the input. And what that does is that it says, when I send that document back, it's not, here's a document I made you. It's, here's a synthesis of that conversation we had about your content, codified in a way that people can use. And then people can actually see themselves in it. And let me tell you what, there is no better way to get people to ignore your document than to just hand it down to them and have them not be able to see themselves in it. I also really believe that this kind of technique can work with content auditing. Content auditing is something that um, I think Misty mentioned, the Jeff Bean quote that's like a mind-numbing journey through your content. And it, it, it can be, right? It's like this would be this mind-numbing spreadsheet of a billion lines trying to just get a sense of everything you have and whether it's good and what you're gonna do with it. But I think it can also be a really useful team activity. Not to get all the details done, but to get people started. Getting people started by going through the content together, actually talking through the content with all of this other stuff we've just talked about in mind. What you can do is you can start getting people to look at sh um, shared traits as they go. When people do that, you get a few things. You get people who I see how others in the group would evaluate a piece of content, and ultimately you'll get more consistent results because of that, because people hear from other people how they would do it, and you can share how you would do it, and ultimately you'll come out with clearer ideas about what needs to happen. This is also something you can get going much earlier this way because you're kind of getting it started with a group and then you're sending them off to actually complete that work. Particularly if you're trying to do like a relaunch of some massive website, like imagine any sort of big corporate behemoth thing where you're like, well, we did a little count and it turns out we have 4,900 pages of content in this one subsite. And you're like, oh crap, what are we gonna do here? You can break that down into a bunch of different people if you get them on the same page first. And you also hear from them about what they actually see as being a problem. I even do this with something that can feel particularly technical or just particularly special, which is content modeling. So I think it's really important because some things can be hard to explain. This is a, a slide from um, a Karen McGrain presentation, her Adapting Ourselves to Adaptive Content presentation where she's talking about content being at the center and that same content needing to be, go out to all of these different destinations, right? That can be a hard concept to explain to people who are used to saying, yeah, no, 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 I put my content in this box in the CMS here, and then it appears here on a web page. Here, here. And you show them this and they're like, what? That can be a big shift, much less this. This is a diagram that has been shared endlessly. It is NPR's COPE model, create once, publish everywhere. This explains how NPR actually gets content from the very uh, end where it has this NPR editors who are entering things into a system, all the way out to all of the different platforms that carry NPR content. You wanna throw that in front of a person who's used to saying, no, I put my content here, it shows here. My head's gonna explode. And it's not because they're not smart, it's not because they're not competent, it's that that is a huge departure from what they know. You show something to somebody that's completely foreign, and yeah, they're gonna freak out. So I try to break this down for them. I try to make this a little bit easier, kind of get them into, into the spirit. By talking to them about things like experience mapping. This is from Adaptive Paths, uh, Guide to Experience Mapping. 
And what we're really talking about here, we're gonna talk to people about content reuse, we're gonna talk to them about getting content in different platforms, we're going to talk about being able to break content up into modules that be used different places. You wanna have them see the content through different eyes. And that means seeing content through a user's eyes. So when I start talking to people about actual customer paths or journeys, I start talking to them about what, what their path actually is like. And we kind of talk through that. We do kind of a, a short exercise where we're really breaking down like what people do, and what steps they go through along the way as they're interacting with your product or interacting with your website or interacting with your service. And then I say, okay, if that's what their path is like, this is the journey that they go on, these are the things that happen to them along the way, I say, well, what content do they need for each of those things? What would actually be helpful to them? What information would be helpful for them to get at every step along the way? And they start saying all these things like, oh, you know, it would be great if in stores people got this. It would be great if our website was able to answer this specific need. You start being able to say uh, content that they have and say, hmm, wow, we have this great information, but actually people at this stage in the journey, they're not seeing that. How do we get that content over there? Or you start seeing gaps. You start saying like, huh, that it would be really useful if we started to have content about this specific topic. Again, I'll do the colored post-it note thing or I'll be like, okay, let's map our content we have currently to places on the journey and then they'll use a different color post-its to map like the gaps of content that we'd really like to have at different places on the journey. And I go through this whole process in order to get to content modeling because it makes it a much more useful question. Because then you're saying, okay, you know what you'd like to have happen. You know what content people need when. What would it take to make that possible? And that's where you can introduce content modeling. You can talk about how, okay, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take the content we have that's in these big kind of pages, and we're trying to break it up for people in ways that'll be logical and useful to them as they go along that path. That's when you can start talking about like things like metadata or rules and conditions without having people glaze over because you're basically saying, so if we want content here, then we need to have this content in these pieces and be able to send it there. It becomes a lot more logical for people once you've done that. And so you start being able to talk about all the different relationships between information, the different chunks of things that you might need. So the thing I wanna talk about here though is that we often talk about things like content modeling as being very like, nitty gritty technical and a specialist job. You have to be able to think about relationships and meaning, but also think about like systems and databases. But if we start breaking that down to being what are the times and places and ways people need to access information, suddenly it's not so special. And I think this is a really important way to think about our work. Our work doesn't belong on a pedestal. It's important, but it belongs with all of these different people, these people who are actually gonna work with the content. The people are gonna edit it, the people are gonna maintain it. And I think a lot of the time, our work really needs to be normalized instead of being mystified. We need our work to be more understandable so that people can actually do something with it. That's how people will see it as theirs, not some system that some expert dreamed up that's separate from them. The more normal we can make our work, the more likely people will be to actually use it. The more likely they'll be to see the website as part of them, part of their job, instead of something that you over here did, instead of one more thing in a full day that they don't understand what they have to deal with now. And so I think back to all those different content problems, right? I think about all these different things that just make me wanna bang my head against the wall, and I think, you know, frustration's not gonna help that getting frustrated at like, why can't people just do what we ask them to do? It's never gonna solve the content mess. No amount of deliverables will either. What's really gonna be useful is when we figure out what fits. To figure out what fits our organizations and the people that are working within them, and what we can make them feel comfortable with, how we can help them feel more comfortable with the direction we're trying to take. They won't do things because you tell them to. They're not gonna say like, oh, this document told me I needed to do this list of 24 things in order to make my content clear and actionable and on brand and prioritized. They won't do it just because they have a checklist. They'll do it because it reflects the way that they see their organization. 
They'll do it because it reflects the way that they see their job. They'll do it because all of those dots connect for them, because they're a part of the process all the way through. And so if you want your user experience work to fit, if you want your user experience work to actually take off, this is the kind of thing we have to do. And all of that really starts with us letting go of some of our control. Letting go of this idea that we can control every aspect of everything. Letting go of this idea that all we have to worry about is our process defined over here. And start embracing the idea, accepting the idea that there's a lot more involved and that it's messier and much more imperfect and that we're gonna get into these workshops and figure it out as we go and it'll still be messy and imperfect and saying, that's okay. Because we're not the masterminds of special people who can do all of this on our own. We gotta carry everybody else along with us. Thank you.